Welcome to Beneath the Force, the Vishal Gondal Show. In my entrepreneurial journey of over 20 years, I've had the pleasure of knowing, interacting and being friends with some of the most amazing super achievers. Each one of them have achieved success in their field by harnessing their knowledge, passion and wealth and have become the force of good. It takes years for one to become an overnight success. I am trying to decode what they did so differently in these years to be where they are today. My guest is a young entrepreneur, Samara Mahindra, who has grown up with horses, did an acting course, studied in Australia and UK, worked for a marketing company in Singapore, but today she is into rehabilitation of cancer patients through her carer program. Welcome Samara to Beneath the Force. Hi, it's a pleasure to be here. Your journey is absolutely fascinating from being with horses to now you know, treating cancer. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell me more about your childhood. How was it growing up with, you know, horse? It's not something normal for people, right, to be growing up with horses in India. So my childhood was, um, it was a childhood that I would very much tag as perfect for any child. Uh, it was one which was in nature. My father, uh, his passion was, um, you know, breeding horses. So we grew up on a stud farm. It was uh, something that we did almost every day where we were, you know, made to horse ride. And um, I would go to school, come back, and it was climbing trees and being around nature. That was where... And and this is right outside Bangalore. This is right outside Bangalore. So uh, we were very used to driving into uh, thick forests while going back home and... um, TVs, uh, cartoons, junk food, things like that were never part of our childhood. And and how was it like, you know, being in Bangalore at that point of time, right? I mean, it must be a very different city then. Yeah, Bangalore has changed so much in the last couple of years. At that point, it was uh, very natural to, you know, a lot of people had farms and um, the kind of childhood we had was more or less very natural with a lot of the friends that I had. Today, it's different. Today, I have niece and nephews who, um, you know, live a very different childhood, uh, more obviously in line with technology and things like that. But um, yeah, that time, Bangalore was more in the space of, you know, nature and um, that kind of and, thing. And, and clearly, you know, growing up with horses, I'm sure you also spent a lot of time riding and doing all kinds of other activities. Yes, that's more or less what we did. We also uh, did a lot of horse riding in Uti. We had a, you know, r- really nice, lovely holiday home over there. And, you know, uh, a lot of races used to happen in Uti. I think it still does. So it was something that, you know, we did every day in the mornings. We would go for horse riding. And, um, and of course, that was a habit that unfortunately died out while I was growing up. But, yeah. And, and you lost your father pretty early, right? And so how was it growing up, you know, with the mother and your siblings in, in the middle of nowhere, literally, right? That's where your house was. Mm-hmm. I lost my father when I was three years old, so I have no recollection of him. Uh, When people talk about him, it's, you know, I I really don't know apart from what I've heard. So I grew up with a woman who uh, was a single parent who then didn't really even make me feel like there was a loss of any other parent. I didn't know otherwise. Uh, You you were all of three that time. I was all of three. And that was the time when uh, my mother was building a very successful company by herself. So I grew up looking and, and, and... idolizing this woman who, you know, kind of uh, pulled all the strings together and kind of got the foundation going to build something for her children and for herself. So that's what I saw while growing up. And and what was a typical weekend for you? Out. It was just being in, um, we had a farm, so it was like spending morning to night climbing trees, picnics, riding bicycles, things like that. It was completely out in nature. And after school, tell me more about your your education. You traveled abroad. So how was that experience? So I finished uh, my education in India till the 12th grade. Then I moved to the UK for a little while. Um, it didn't suit me. So I moved to Australia and I was well, there. For, the, the weather of... The uh, weather didn't suit me. <laughs> and which city were you in the UK? I was in, I was in Kent. I was in Kent. Well, gloomy days there, right? Oh, yeah, Yeah. completely, completely. I was quite a protected, spoiled little child. So for me to leave home, it, it, you know, it was was a big step. And I was very homesick as well. And the weather definitely didn't help the situation. Uh, So I moved to Australia. 
uh, and then I lived in the Gold Coast, and I was there. Well, that's that's quite a place to be. And, and yes, and it was we would go surfing and then come to class. So it was. And, and what did you study in in Australia? So I did a bachelor's in business, uh, and then I went further and did a master's in corporate communication. So growing up in Bangalore in a stud farm, then going to UK, and then going to Australia. Mm-hmm. But life had something else planned for you. After that, you went into something completely different. Yes, so I did everything in my power to stay back in Australia. So I did every course and degree possible, and then eventually my family said it's about time. I had this apprehension to move back to Bangalore for some reason. I just wanted to, you know, see the world and travel. And so, so can you recall a conversation with your mom mm-hmm. on you wanting to stay in Australia and she wanting you to come back? I tried, but there was no conversation because my mom, my mother was a very, you can call her strict person. So it was a very understood, you're coming back, you know. Um, so the only way that I could get her to let me be there was to do every course possible. Then, but then even after that, so she education said, was something she was fine with. Yes, yes. And but you, then even that was there was a limit to that. And you kept educating. You became masters. Yes. Uh, the only thing left was to do a PhD. To do I a guess. PhD, yes. And did so, that th- thought ever come to you? Yeah, that I should it did. Go for a PhD, it did. It did. It did. Uh, but then there was like you know she had the end of it, so she said. And, and you are the youngest in your I family, am. and and who are the other? You have siblings, right? So yes. So I have two older sisters and a brother. Um, so I'm the youngest, and uh, she just wanted me back. She was very, very close to me, very close. And your sisters and brother, they're all in Bangalore. Yes. Right now. Yes. And did they also study abroad or were they in Bangalore or were you the only one who like went across the world? And No, the sister just above me also studied abroad. In fact, she was in Australia. Okay. So that's where I, I got the green signal to leave Kent and say, OK, fine, uh, you can move to Australia because your sister is over there. So um, she was studying there as well. But then she also eventually finished her degrees and moved back. And I just was stuck over there. So I then, anyways, eventually I did move back, uh, but I didn't want to come to Bangalore. So I went to, I came to Mumbai instead. And, and you went to Singapore? I went to Singapore after that. After, after Mumbai. After, oh. after Mumbai. But you had a very interesting uh, story on why you came to Mumbai. Yes. So I, like I said, I was trying to do everything in my power to not come back to Bangalore. Um, so I remember very clearly actually researching uh, Mumbai and thinking, okay, what can I do over there that can be a good enough reason for me to stay in Mumbai and not uh, be in Bangalore? And obviously being the land of Bollywood. Bollywood, yeah. yeah. The first thing was, you know, an acting course. And I remember seeing it online and seeing this acting course by Barry John. And I said, you know what, this would be a, you know, a good idea. So I kind of put that across to my family. Well, for all the listeners out there, there are many other things to do in Mumbai <laughs> apart from just acting. Yes, yes. Uh, but yeah, one of the top reasons for people to come to Mumbai is to is to join Bollywood. So. <laughs> yes, and at that, that time, you know, that's... Of course, today it's a... You know, I've seen a different Mumbai altogether. But at that point, it was just, you know, do whatever it takes. And so I presented this to my family and they thought I had lost my mind because it's just me and the kind of person I am and acting does not equate in any um, sense. So they... they well, looking at most of the other Bollywood stars, I don't think so acting <laughs> equates true. there. <laughs> that's true. Anyways, they said, okay, go do it because you have, you know, dedicated a lot of your time to actually studying and getting your degrees. So fine, this is a phase, let her do it. So I start. I did Barry John, but actually Barry John was uh, an eye opener for me. It mm-hmm. um, it made me uh, learn a lot about myself. So, so Barry John is this very successful acting institute, right? Yes, that's, that's really. And I think Barry John has been doing this for like quite some time. A long time, and he is a theater professional um, who then went into acting. So we did a lot of theater in our course, and a lot about. And how long was this course? This was. Oh, it was like about three months. Three months. So, okay. but it was an intense three months, and um, and yeah, and it gave me a lot uh, of understanding of who I was as a person. Opened me up, um, made me less dependent on you know my family or my mother, and learn more about mm-hmm. who I was basically. So the acting course was not really to join Bollywood. Not at all. Although my friends and my family, you know, still tease me about it. And they think that, you know, it was just something that I wanted to do somewhere deep down inside. I did try to convince myself as well to a certain point, And I said, just do it, you know, like just go for auditions, maybe just try. Uh, but I know it was not, you know, it was not in my blood to it. Well, all I can say is that Bollywood's loss was humanity's gain. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> That's very sweet, yeah. In this course, you you were talking about confidence mm-hmm. and how did acting help you get become more confident? Because you're put into a position where you need to, you know, embody um, a certain character um, and you need to be real and you can't do that till you understand who you are as a person and that's what I really give credit to Barry John for because he kept teaching us about, you know, breaking our own mirrors and our own shields and learning who we were as people so that we can take over roles of or characters of, you know. Of others. Of others. And uh, that was a big deal. We went through, I mean, at least I went through a lot of emotional, dis, you know, roller, like it was an emotional roller coaster, basically. Um, oh, I thought acting courses where you just go and read some lines and they will give, take photographs of all kinds. So did I. That's why I joined. <laughs> but uh, no, it was a completely different uh, experience. Uh, it was a group of people who came together and probably shared more amongst each other than I shared with my family for so many years. You really, you you know, you're, you're bare. So this is almost therapy. It It is therapy. It is therapeutic, actually. It's highly recommended to people who are, um, you know, finding themselves or introverted or, yeah. So, so basically, before that course, you considered yourself an introvert. Hundred percent. And how did that change? Through the 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 process of uh, you know figuring out what a uh, or who I am to a certain degree. And how was the how big was the class? How many people are there in a in a in a batch? I think there were about fifteen of us. Okay, so that's not very big. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah it was not a very big class. Yeah, that was the process, and um, I didn't realize it was happening. It was happening at a very subconscious level. At that time as well, I was going through, you know, the worst experience of my life. And that is my mother going through cancer. So there I was, you know, um, and maybe acting was a sense of release and escapism to a certain degree with what was actually happening at home and at re- in reality. So um, it was these two different worlds that I was living for some time. And for some reason, I enjoyed that and I liked that. And out of all the 15 people who were in the course, how many of them actually ended up making it to Bollywood? I think two or three of them went on to becoming pretty successful. Yeah, and you were telling me about Arjun and yes. Varun and I was yes. like, who are these people? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, uh, Arjun Kapoor and Varun Dhawan was yeah. in my course. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sure they have done well, but not as well as what you are doing. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> but uh, I still want to be in Mumbai. So... Being young, being, you know, doing a course like this with such an amazing group of people, why wouldn't you want to join Bollywood? There was a point where I said, you know, maybe this is something I want to do. What really interested me was theatre. So I actually went on after the three months to go and do theatre workshops. Um, I remember Neeraj Krabi was Neeraj Krabi was one of the theatre workshops that I did. And I did many after that. I became, I got into this loop of doing theater. I started, I kind of almost overdosed on this whole concept of expressing myself and being extroverted, but in a very restricted environment. Mm-hmm. I, I got, um, it was just a way of, like I said, expressing myself. But I also feel like it ran its course. You know, I, f- I feel like it, it reached a point where it wasn't doing that for me anymore. And that's when I knew that I had to move on. That was also a time, um, you know, when, my mother fell really ill. So so when did you learn? When did you first came to know about your mother's illness? So when she was first diagnosed, she showed up in the UK when I was studying in Kent and um, she didn't even tell me what can- you know that she had cancer. I didn't even know what cancer was. I just knew it was something really scary. And uh, obviously when I found out, it was a big shock. Um, she got treated then and there and she was fine. And uh, about eight months... And, and what kind of cancer was this? It started uh, as cervical cancer. Mm-hmm. So cancer that was and is 100% preventable and treatable. Mm-hmm. You know? So it was just lack of knowledge. Um, you know, if... And this is what, 2005? Test, or which year was this? Um, so she was... Yes, it was about 2004, 2005. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then she relapsed eight months later. And when she relapsed eight months later, she decided that she didn't want to continue treatment. And, you know, she said, I, whatever treatment I'm going to do, it's going to be in India. She was given six months. The The, the oncologist said that it's done. And where, where did she go for treatment in India? In Bangalore. She went to Manipal Hospital. Mm-hmm. There was really no hope. We really thought that it was the, the end. Um, but she went on for about six and a half years after that. Six and a half years post that. Yes. And what... 
what let her what kept her going 100% her state of mind she was a very physically active person someone who ate well and uh, she just she she just didn't give up there was cancer was just did not take up her life she would get a treatment the next day she was back at work and and she started a very successful business yes tell me more about this business what was this business all about so she started a garment export company she was left in a situation where my father had passed away and uh, she was living in this huge farmhouse and really didn't know much apart from obviously the previous years of being a housewife and traveling the world and all of that but nothing to do with business and she knew she had to start from scratch because she had four children that she had to fend for so she literally started from scratch she built a garment export company because she had this inherent um, you know curiosity with or liking towards uh, clothes and fashion and all of that and yeah and slowly but surely in about 10 to 20 years she built this company so this was a company completely started by her in about 2005 you know when she and the family came to know about you know so who started running this company was she still continuing that she was still continuing but what she did um which is very much like my mother is that when she relapsed she started training all of us so she would um, my sister was already in the com- my older sister was already uh, in the company doing some work and she started training her and she started uh, teaching her how to you know hold the reins and all of that but uh, i think till the last month she was still working and she still went to work and while she was going through her therapy and cancer treatment you then went to australia when was the australia yeah it was around that time i was in australia around that time and you kept going back and forth yes, between yes yes and that's why there was this um you know she she wanted me to always be there she was very close to me so that's why there was a certain amount of guilt because uh, there i was doing these degrees because i just didn't want to come back home and again maybe it was a form of escaping what was going on and she wanted me to be there so there was no um, you know kind of explanation it was just an it was just an understanding that you have to come home mm-hmm. so i said fine i will and i will be in india but i'll be in mumbai and that's so where. so what was her treatment like what did you see in the last in that 6 years what what happened what did oh the gosh. doctors do we lived in hospitals uh she had multiple rounds of chemotherapy so you can imagine in 6 years it was just constant chemotherapy so it's almost till from 2005 to 2010 10 yeah 2004 to 2010 yeah 2004 yeah. to 2010 so like 6 yeah. years of chemotherapy yeah and it was just constant so our lives became the hospitals doctors and how she was feeling and tests so i lived in or i think i can speak for my family we lived in uh, anxiety for 6 years every time i got a call from a family member that was not expected it was like my heart would race In fact today I you know very happily switch off my phone at night and you know a lot of people ask me you switch your phone off and I say you know it's such a luxury for me to do that because it was constantly on call living on the edge that if something is going to happen what's going to happen because we knew that there is um, I mean there's just we were just trying different types of drugs and we were just And what were the kind of conversations you used to have with your mother during this 6 years My mother was a very strong woman so she would really face it up front and she would sit with each one of us she would call us in she would tell us about how to run the business how to live you know um what kind of man we should marry you know how to deal with the finances how to deal with the properties um she would really really go deep down into managing everything and you know of course we wouldn't hear of it and we wouldn't you know accept it at the start but today thank god she did thank god she did so she was very very upfront about it she was not one of those patients who said um you know you talk to my family and i'll just deal with it um without really knowing what's going on she used to send us out of the room and say tell her, tell me what's going on how much time do i left um let me get my stuff in order and and you saw the treatment very closely yes and and i know the cancer treatment can be really harsh not only on the patient but also on the near and dear ones mm-hmm. uh what were the thoughts which were going through you when you were seeing the treatment i was in a 
you know, I was in a um, space of days. I had no idea. I was very naive. Um, I just held on to any hope that I could find. And um, it was it it was torturous for all of us because we felt a very deep sense of helplessness. And that's what I see even today. Uh, a very deep sense of cluelessness, just not knowing. And um, we put like all our faith into, you know, the doctors and that's it. And didn't question, just went with it. Um, and uh, it was just whatever we could do, whatever hope we could hold on to, that's all we did. The The problem was that, you know, she, there was one side of her where she just wanted to get on with life and say, you know, this is a part of what I'm going through right now and whatever. This, the other part was that we never spoke about it. It was not an open conversation that we would have. I didn't even speak to my friends about it for six years. You know, it was not something that I even mentioned. It was just everyone knew, but it was very hush. We would not even talk about it too much. She was 100% not even interested in having a conversation about what she was going through to any stranger or anyone else outside the family. So it was almost like ignored to a certain degree. Um, and uh, I think. And then why was that? Why why were why was she or you not willing to talk about it? She didn't want us to talk about it, but for her, um, it was. I think there was a lot of pride. Cancer can be very debilitating in terms of your how you look physically, how you, it takes a toll on you in, emotionally. She didn't want something to fight her down. You know, she was a fighter, so she's like, nothing is going to take me down. And if I put emphasis on this, then it's going to just. Um, emphasize the seriousness of what's going on so she just didn't want people to sympathize or look at her differently uh, there was a lot of a lot of pride so so for her this was kind of revealing her weakness yeah. rather than coming up as a strong person yes completely she had control over everything in her life uh, the way she brought up her kids the way she ran her company the way the house was run the way we lived our lives this one thing she just couldn't seem to have control over. From saying that she's going to survive six months to going for six years, that that must be quite some strength she had. Definitely. So what gave her that strength? I think her children. Her life was us, to be very honest. Um, she came from a very, very underprivileged background. She didn't come from much at all. For her to have built what she did and give us what we had was a big deal you know and her way of showing the immense amount of love that she had for each one of us was you know by showering us with all of this stuff and that was her true happiness in fact we laugh about it today but we traveled and saw more of the world in the six years that she was going through cancer than we ever did in our entire lives she loved traveling the world she loved seeing new countries mm -hmm. And um, I remember her oncologist used to like, literally she used to plan, we used to plan travel holidays according to her chemo cycles. And we were teased that, you know, this family, the amount of family holidays they go on is ridiculous. But that's all we did. We just saw the world in six years. So which was your last favorite holiday with her? I think it was London. Mm -hmm. She loved London. Uh, that was just like a, you know, almost like a second home to us. And... Um, I remember her being her strongest and, you know, of course she was going through a cancer, but I remember having still my mother mm -hmm. um, when we went to London. And mm -hmm. and after that, unfortunately, um, yeah. So so what out. changed? I mean, why, you know, she, she went on till six years, but what changed in the last, you know, last six months or whatever? What, what, what did you think made that difference? Her body gave up. Um, I still say this, the treatment took her not anything not the cancer you know yes we we were told that the cancer spread and all of that but eventually to have that many rounds of chemotherapy her body gave up it just gave up she was doing okay everything was being managed one day she looked at me and she said I'm not getting out of bed and that's very unlike her I'm not going to work and uh, no I don't feel like eating exactly a month after that she passed away so she gave up but I think she had reached a point where, you know, it was fighting the treatment um, and um, the immunity just crashed. Mm -hmm. and, that's and, and, and I think it's possibly well known that in the case of cancer, it's the treatment which causes uh, the most amount of side effects. 
yeah i think we're in a catch 22 because the treatment is toxic so you know you you need the treatment to kind of destroy the cancer cells but it's destroying your immunity as well and your immunity is what's going to get you yeah. through yeah. so we're in a catch 22 you know i must say that you know hats off to your mom i think uh, you know her, her story and her life has been inspirational and her kids are definitely yes. celebrating her legacy yes no, well yeah hopefully I'm that's doing a good amazing job no no that's amazing but i think what's even more incredible is that after all of this you know you you had a career in marketing you could have gone into bollywood you had a family business or you could have just done nothing and you know i'm sure your mother had connect collected enough wealth for you to just keep roaming around the world and there are many people who go through close relatives friends going through terminal illness and eventually passing off but your reaction to this was completely different and that changed your life uh so what made you do what you did so um i have always had this inherent um you know interest in health and wellness it's just always been there um more so than everyone else it's something that i've always been interested in the body um you know anatomy nutrition and i used to watch her uh, every time she ate better she or she was you know more physically active she would take to treatment better so i would notice all these things um, but i couldn't really you know put something to it or uh, speak about it because i didn't know it was just something i noticed now after she passed away it was you know it was a horrible experience of course but i knew that i couldn't be the same i knew that you know either i can be a victim and just be miserable and say you know my life has come to an end um and do nothing with my life or i can actually get up and do something about it and i think a little bit of my mother's dna in that sense remained in getting up and doing something about it and she those years that she used to advise us she used to say make something of yourself make something of yourself it's all in your hands so it was almost like um owing it to her to start with but i never thought it would be the space of oncology it took me into that space i knew i wanted and, and you're not trained in medicine or anything not right? a doctor. so how do you just decide and say i'm going to start you know treating the most you know terminal diseases and care for sick patients how did that happen i know and it, it's shocking even today and when i speak to oncologists who we work very closely with they're saying good good you didn't train as a doctor <laughs> but uh, for the longest time i didn't even fathom getting into the space of medicine because i i was you know i i thought i'm but i'm not a doctor how can i do it um so i said let me learn a uh, fitness let me learn anatomy let me learn um movement therapy and so i just packed my bags one day and i moved so, to so New what is movement therapy it's using just functional movement and uh, so is it like functional training is that it's like functional training exactly so i said let me go and uh, understand it so i went and i moved to and and when you did that did were you clear that you're going to do all of this eventually to start something definitely was... not so when i actually um when after she passed away and i said okay i need to start doing something with my life uh, i looked at what we had and she had you know we had uh, multiple and this is after how many months or this, uh, this was... was after about a year and a half about a year so. and a half okay. a year and um i saw okay fine what are what are the resources we have okay we have factories we manufacture clothes let let's create a sportswear label you know the there is a lack of good sportswear in india so um one of the labels that i really liked was lululemon and i said how do we recreate something like that you for know, in as i was telling you i met the founder yes. of lululemon uh, just last month in vancouver and his story itself is incredible and yes. lululemon is just such an iconic brand yeah now. absolutely and well you could have started something like lululemon in india i could have started something like lululemon and um, we had actually gone into the process of r&d and sourcing the fabrics and um, actually getting quite a lot of investment and things like that into it but something was amiss something just wasn't feeling right i knew i was using the sportswear label as a stepping stone into get getting into the actual realm of health and fitness uh while everyone around me who was kind of you know investing in this thought that oh we're going to build this incredible brand so i felt that i was not doing justice to what i really believed in so i literally woke up one morning and i remember going to my older sister and i said i'm not doing this 
I'm not starting the sportswear <laughs> label. And she's just like, you have lost your mind. So I said, maybe I have, but let me, let me find it then. Let me figure it out. Saw this um, fitness course in New York and literally a month later, packed my bags and moved to New York City, not knowing one person there. And uh, they said, how are you going to do it? You've, you know, you're going through this loss of your mother. You're completely lost in terms of what you want to do with your life. And now you want to move to, you know, New York City, not knowing anybody and doing fitness. And I said, yeah, it's exactly what I'm going to do. And, uh, and how long was that course? So that course was a couple of months, okay. but it was a very intensive course. Um, and when I did that, they exposed me to something called special populations, which is, you know, um, doing movement therapy for disabled people and, uh, you know, those going through chronic ailments, all of that. And obviously, I thought to myself, oh, I wonder if there's something in the space of oncology and cancer. And I remember my lecturer then turned around and said, of course there is. And I remember saying, but don't have to be a doctor. And he said, absolutely not. And then um, that's when I trained further to become a cancer exercise specialist. And is there something called cancer exercise specialist? Yes, yes. And you learn over, you know, you learn about over yeah 25 different types of cancers and how to deal with uh, the physical rehab of patients. Uh, so it's a very physical way of, you know, healing a patient. Of and that course, was not in New York? That was in Portland, Oregon, from the Cancer Exercise Training Institute. Literally from the East Coast to the West Coast. And yes, and it was, and from there, um, I went further into breast cancer recovery training. Because obviously, um, you know, a lot of breast cancer patients have mastectomies and double mastectomies that result in a lot of postural deviations and a lot of physical implications on the body. So it was a very natural um, step for me to get into breast cancer recovery training. I did that. And then um, I actually worked for a nonprofit organization in New York City called Moving for Life, which was a dance, uh, they're using dance therapy to rehab, to rehabilitate patients. So, so you also are a dancer? No, 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 okay. not at all. I was like, God, okay, far, you've done everything. You've done Bollywood acting. <laughs> no. So maybe no, you're no. also into dancing. No, no, not at all. Uh, but I just said, you know, uh, this is, um, it was so interesting to see what these guys were doing and they were giving free uh, dance therapeutic classes to patients all over the city. And I said, let me go work with them. And I did. And that's when I had my first encounter with patients and survivors. And I would see them feel and get better. There was something that was happening. And I would start talking to them. And they said, you know, we don't know what it is. But we this is like liberating coming to these dance classes. And um, and I just saw them. Get and this better. was dance classes specifically for cancer yes, patients. Yes, yes, yes. And and did you go to any of the, the cancer hospitals or any of the wards and stuff? Yes. So then I went to uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City, which is one of the top cancer institutes in the world. I met the founder of the integrative uh, center over there called uh, Barry Castellet. And I told her that, you know, this is something that uh, I noticed doesn't exist in India. And do you think I could do something like this? And she said, well, you will never know till you try. And um, it is something that is needed for patients and survivors. And we can't only rely on conventional treatment. We need to look after and heal a patient as a whole. So how is that possible? I was told cancer is all about chemotherapy and nothing else. Well, And we all heard about Steve Jobs who tried all these alternate therapies and couldn't make it. So, you know, what happens is uh, there is so much emphasis and... Uh, uh, perspective put on treatment because it's it's obviously a massive industry but when you go and dig deep down into why cancer even happened in the first place you will realize that the treatment deals with the physical symptoms obviously of the tumor or whatever that is showing up but cancer just doesn't happen out of bad luck you know it, it there is a reason why it happened now whether that's in, through emotional distress for um, many many years or well, genetics is gen does genetics yes but even genetics plays a role but honestly five to ten percent of cancer cases are genetic um, they say about 90 percent is lifestyle related mm -hmm. so if it is lifestyle related mm -hmm. let's deal with that let's deal with lifestyle you know obviously there is go it is going to come back if we don't deal with the root cause of why it um, occurred in the first place so when I went to Memorial Stone Kettering I, I was just completely shocked because there a patient comes in they get their treatment but they also get 
you know, very personalized clinical nutritionist to work with them. They also are given movement therapy. They're also given mind-body therapies like meditation and hypnosis and things like that. So they're dealt with very physically, mentally, and emotionally. And that is their treatment protocol. And that is something that just did not exist when my mother was going through treatment in India. So I was in a, I was in a dilemma. I said, you know, just what if I went back to India and tried to do something like this and will probably be the first person that is doing it and it would be a you know epic fail or a epic success but but why come to india you could have continued doing this in the us or you know i mean there are already established centers why did you want to come back and do it in india just because it didn't have it just because it you know india's home this is my this is my home this, this is the place that i was born this is the place that my mother was treated for so many years and i have seen so many patients and survivors just like my mother who don't know about this and i i felt that you know yes it would have been easy for me to stay back in the us because it's a fully established way of healing over there or i could just come and do it over here and but, establish but it it did make sense right i mean how would anybody take you seriously because you were like you know your background is into business and then media and then acting and <laughs> now you are suddenly coming and saying you're going to start curing people or helping people with cancer uh, how did this all add up so i had a lot of fears i wasn't sure it's go- if it's going to work but definitely i did a lot of training uh, in terms of even being able to meet oncologists and hospitals and say that i have some kind of credibility to talk about oncology i'm not a doctor i don't know your space in terms of conventional treatment but i do know how to uh, you know work with rehabilitation through physical movement i do know about nutrition to a certain extent because i went and i did a course at the integrative uh, institute for the institute for integrative nutrition in new york where it trained me as a holistic health coach so i did come with some kind of credibility um but yes there was a lot of apprehension and a lot of fears and and especially doctors who have got trained for years and how would they take somebody like you seriously how was it like to convince the doctors on first of all convincing what you were trying how how did you explain them what was your program so when i moved to india i still wasn't sure how i was going to set up you know integrative healing or holistic therapies for cancer i said let me understand the healthcare space in india first so i was very fortunate to do a stint at tata memorial hospital in mumbai where i literally observed um you know i did an observership so i just was under this one particular oncologist and i just was his shadow everywhere and i used to sit so there's an observership yeah it's an observership not internship not an internship it's an observership you just watch so i did that and i used to sit in his consults and i used to go for rounds with him and i used to meet his patients and i used to be in all the departments in tata memorial and i was completely blown away by what's going on um so you were like the the proverbial fly on the wall yes exactly like that and one one thing i noticed was that in the consults that i sat at uh, you know all the it's it was funny it was like a mirror image or or a replay of our lives like you know i would see families walk in and almost mimicking like us like ground, ground hog day the yeah. same day repeats again and yeah, again and yeah. you see the same story the same story and they all said okay treatment is fine but now what and there was no concise or like answer basically to say you know what this is what you can do take these precautions do this it was like you know try to be healthy be normal eat healthy those were the answers which is not good enough so um so i said you know there has to be an answer to something like this my initial thought was set up in the hospital and in fact actually the response was really really good like a lot of the hospitals and oncologists were very open to the concept because i brought in or what i was proposing was complementary therapies i did not say alternative that is a no no so i said so, so just to, what is the difference between alternative and complementary therapy so complementary therapies are uh, evidence based therapies they uh, have a lot of proven studies to show the you know the effect that it has on certain types of cancers and healing certain types of cancers alternative therapies are one where you say no to treatment and you do the alternative 
You know? And I think the, the big problem right now is that people don't know that there are complementary therapies. Mostly it's and yes. this is either you take chemotherapy or you become vegan and go yes. and take this Ayurvedic treatment or do homeopathy and do this and do that. And the minute you do this, you know, your chances are half or whatever. Yeah. But the complementary therapy allows you to do both yes. chemotherapy and the traditional allopathy. It allows you to do allopathic medicine plus holistic therapies that are evidence-based. So example would be obviously nutrition, um, would be yoga therapy. There are a lot of studies with yoga therapy and uh, especially things like breast cancer. Um, it would be meditations. It would be um, music therapy. So various different types of therapies that fall under the spectrum of complementary. But once you go into, unfortunately, even something like Ayurveda is it's tagged as alternative. Um, homeopathy is tagged as alternative. So so why are these therapies not covered as complementary therapies? I thought they were always complementing chemotherapy and things like that. I think there's just a lack of, I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I think there's lack of evidence that is required for something like this to work um a lot of the mainstream treatment goes on or more or less all the mainstream treatment goes on what are the studies behind it what are what is what is the evidence behind something like this where are the where are the proven um you know studies that this is actually so, so when you came back and you started carer mm. how did you get your first patient yeah that was uh god i don't think i'll ever forget my first patient so um you know, I started Kero um, last year and we did a pilot and it was a very different concept. We used technology to reach out to the mass. So we said, let's bridge the gap between, you know, these very high end specialists, cancer care specialists and bridge it um, and provide their services to the mass. I think it was way above, uh, way beyond its time. And people just didn't get the concept of using, you know, the form of technology in, in healing. But we kind of held fought for a while and um, then an article of mine came out in a, um, in a newspaper and after that this person, I mean a couple of people got in touch and this one person who obviously believed in what we were doing got the program but then it has evolved tremendously from there. And, today, and, and what is the carer program? How do you explain it to a layman? What are you exactly doing? So what we do is we are a full-blown home healthcare company. We provide holistic therapies that work with treatment for patients going through treatment as well as post-treatment. So we deal with um, managing the side effects of treatment better, increasing the effectiveness of treatment, building immunity, that's key, and um, putting them on the path to decreasing the chances of relapse. So that's what we focus on. And we do this through four fundamental therapies. One is diet and nutrition. Two is yoga therapy specifically for cancer. Three is meditation. And four is a lot of coaching and counseling and support for the patients as well as family members. So so when you started, I mean, this sounds like a very crazy idea. How could yoga therapy and meditation, you know, I mean, convincing a doctor or, you know, traditional medical system to adopt to this must be a challenge. What um, played in our favor is the fact that there are a lot of studies and a lot of evidence that is showing significant amount of uh, positive implications that these therapies are having on, an, you know, the healing or recovery of a patient. So when I went to doctors, I didn't say that we're doing holistic therapies. I said integrative oncology. So integrative oncology is a very well-established fact. A well established way of treatment or healing in the West. So they knew it. That they got the concept. They obviously asked me, but what are the therapies? Now the the degree of um you know believing in this working or not ranges from doctor to doctor. There are some oncologists who very much support what we're talking about and says I completely agree with it. And there are some oncologists who say, ah, maybe like, you know no, but how did you convince to them to work with you? Because you don't have a doc, you know, background in medicine or any of these things, right? I mean, you come from a completely different background and how could doctors take this entire thing so seriously? Because of the specialists that I got on board. It took us about two years to even procure the right kind of specialist. I was very particular about who are these specialists that are going into the homes of 
my clients and it took us a very long time i mean even something like yoga where we are in the land of yoga to find yoga therapists not teachers but therapists that work with chronic ailments and have a background in cancer or have worked with cancer was a nightmare and um, the same with all the other specialists so it took us a very long time so the the group of specialists that we have now got together are certainly the best in their respective fields so the people who worked with, with our clients through nutrition are all clinical nutritionists those who work uh, with yoga and they are all yoga therapists that work in the space of cancer the same with meditation and then of course we do a lot of coaching and all of that so it was not selling me or talking about my credibility it was talking about these people because these people are you know um steering the ship so so you had to convince two set of people right the doctors and then the patients themselves so how do you get the patients to actually believe in something like this because again this is completely new in india so what happened was when we um w- once we evolved into a home healthcare company we launched with manipal hospital in uh, bangalore now what happened was that they came to us and they said yes this works but you can only come on board or sell this to our patients post treatment now i knew that integrative healing is the best or most effective when a patient is diagnosed so i said let me start going to oncologists as well when i presented this to the oncologists i said i'm an extension of your treatment we work with you we will give you a stronger more compliant patient because we're dealing and managing the side effects of your treatment much better we're dealing with the collateral damage that your treatment is giving to a patient so they were very for it and they you know they they agreed with the concept the and how do you send the data back to these doctors how do they know what their patients are doing it's a very personalized program so every uh, patient that comes on board a schedule is created for them and they go on they are with us for about 6 months and uh, all the referring doctors uh, get a report every week to let them know how their patient is doing you know so so and so how is this different than the traditional cancer treatment you know let's assume that there are two people both undergoing cancer treatment how and one is on your program and one is without your program how would both these journeys look like well one who is just doing the conventional treatment is uh, bombarding its system with toxic treatment and suppressing the immune system even further they have uh, like i said the side effects are worse they um, are obviously going or dealing with the treatment at a much severe level and of course their chances of relapse are higher when we come into play we work with the treatment so we say the doctors and the oncologists are and the your treatment protocol is essential and they're dealing with the physical symptoms now let's dig deep down into why it happened in the first place and clear out that so deal with the root cause so whether that's through diet and nutrition whether that's through yoga through emotional disturbances which are very very major parts to play in you know chronic ailments uh we go into that and we spend consib- considerable amount of time with them for 6 months to clear that out so so in a way that the traditional treatment is essentially treating the symptom and suppressing the symptom and carpet bombing you know the hell out of you you know and figuring out something is going to work and what you are doing is complementing this with some really precision uh therapies which could kind of help people in their mind body or whatever challenge they have and how effective is this well we are um, new in the space but we are seeing patients getting better we you know work with them almost every day we see them emotionally in a stronger place um their side effects are much lower than what a normal person who is just going through conventional treatment uh, you know would so give an example of how different could be the side effects for people with and without the carer program oh my god so like even things like uh, fatigue one of the biggest side effects of cancer treatment so a lot of you know your when you go through treatment um, you get extremely physically weak and another element of that is depression you know a lot of you go into a very a uh, dark space of mind so we come in there we work with you physically in terms of you know reenergizing the body using yoga therapy to you know just even do very effective pranayam and things like that so they are much stronger so we have noticed that a lot of our patients um you know are not even their 
the days that they're taking to recover is shortening. So, you know, usually maybe a patient would take three to five to seven days or whatever after treatment. And it is decreasing as we work with them. So we notice these kind of things. So so cancer is literally becoming an epidemic, right? I mean, the amount of people It is an hear. epidemic. So what is, I mean, is there a prevention? How could somebody prevent having cancer? There are so many uh, ways to prevent it. I think it's a balanced life. I think it's your lifestyle. It's the way you eat. It's the way you live your life. Stress, chronic stress is really a killer. A lot of people turn around and ask me, yeah, but you know, what do you mean by stress? How how does that work? Because if you're chronically stressed for a long period of time, you release cortisol in your system, which feeds cancer, which basically increases inflammation in the body and cancer loves inflammation. So anything that is chronic for a long period of time will manifest into something like a chronic disease, one of which can be cancer. So, you know, managing your stress, your sleep, sleep is when you heal, is actually, we, we give very, very um, limited importance to, you know, how much we sleep and how well we sleep. Um, and yeah, and, and movement. These are all ways to keep the body healthy physically and mentally. And that's all there is to it, you know. So it's not about going extremes. It's not about, you know, I want to be a fruitarian or whatever it is. It's about living in balance. There are a lot of people out there that might not have the healthiest diet, but are the happiest people and are completely disease-free. That says something. So it's a it's about a balance. And the current system... How open is it to alternate therapies or complementary therapies like this? Much more open than I thought. Much more open than I thought. Yes, I did have encounters of, you know, a certain few who were completely not interested or just said that this is just another thing and forget it. It's our treatment and that's it. Alternative treatment is, I think, there is still a way to go um, because it is not in their realm of... uh, treatment but complementary yes there are a lot of uh, they are open to it because we're not saying anything that is against their system if an oncologist turns around and says that what carer is providing can do harm to a client or a patient you know honestly that oncologist should not be practicing so yeah in the in the current medical system which is so you know let's say inundated with medicines and so inundated with their own protocols when you introduce something like yoga, uh, how do you measure the success of that? We have our own studies that we're doing with each one of our patients. So we obviously have an assessment sheet that we give to them or, or that we record at the start of their you know, yoga sessions and then something that we monitor every week. And uh, obviously our yoga therapists are equipped to understand and also notice when a patient is getting physically stronger. And then, of course, record the data again at the end of the yoga sessions. So that's where we're recording data constantly. And and how has this program evolved now? now it's almost over a year, year and a half uh, since you're running this? No, so we started last year in June. So but like I, a year, yeah. yeah like, but like I said, we started as an online platform and um, we did a pilot so it wasn't officially launched. We officially launched launched last year in September as a, a home healthcare company, but it was post-treatment. Today, we have changed it and we work mainly with patients who have just been diagnosed. I remember Luke, the master coach at Goki, told me about you. He was absolutely excited because for the first time, there was somebody else talking <laughs> about integrated health. Yeah. So tell me about your encounter with Luke. How did you meet him? Luke has been just fantastic in this uh, journey. He really has been one of the people that has encouraged me to go and do this because obviously you have fears uh, because you're not in the space. So you're not a medical doctor. So um, when I first met Luke, first of all, it took me a very long to get, a long time to even get in a you know meeting with him. And when I did, I spoke my you know heart. I told him exactly what what I had been through, what my dreams are, and um, I was like, you know, call me crazy, but this is what I think I'm 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 about to do. And he hundred percent supported. He said, listen, this is what's needed, and I have to encourage people like you because it is what's needed. So he has been very integral in you know making care of what it is today. 
No, and I think you really require champions like Luke. So, 100%. who are the other people who helped you in your journey? So, we have some um, fantastic oncologists, actually. One of which is Dr. Vishal Rao. Now, he's he is a man who is just more than a doctor. He sees beyond anyone else does. So, he has really encouraged me in this. Um, another doctor would be Dr. Poonam Patel, who pushed this through as well. And... Uh, I think these are the main people that really encourage me and and help me get a very strong team on board and whoever we've got from there has been perfect for the part and has and and really lives what we talk about and uh, you know like it's just it's a part of what they believe as well so yeah you know I I still remember you talking about the time you lost your mom uh that was 2011 2010 10 2010 and now it's 2017 mm-hmm. and in 7 years from being a helpless uh you know uh, relative of a chronically ill patient to today helping people how has that journey been i mean and it's it's mind blowing what you've been able to do it's been incredible like i was telling you earlier it is bitter sweet because i know that and i tell my family this i know that our program would have probably saved my mother's life what we have created today would have 100% put her into a better path to recovery but at the same time i would never have created something like this if it wasn't for her obviously never knowing that i would ever get into the space um, or even be able to talk to doctors and hospitals and today deal with patients one on one and see them get better because of what we're doing is just was i mean there is no way that it was even in my thought process but it's amazing how i don't know the universe conspires and opens up these pathways for you and it has just been a snowball effect from one to the other and and, and it's it's amazing that a lot of uh, super achievers i speak to always give credit to the universe <laughs> for making things happen i'm sure there are things beyond the universe which are also helping you so what are those things or what are those people um i think my family although they were apprehensive at the start of me you know getting into the space of oncology after that they've just been rock solid just rock solid it's always been this this feeling of comfort because i know if i fail or if i fall they are there no matter what and sometimes you just need that you just need that um feeling that someone is standing behind you and they've really consistently done that and and did you ever have had the fear of failing in this i mean this is like oh my god every day every day every day i have a fear of failing fear of failing in terms of um you know am i going to get that patient better is this company going to reach out to as many patients as we, as we would like you know will the hospitals and oncologists still you know entertain what we're doing um will i live up to my dreams because i have very 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 big dreams so the the fear of failing is there every day every day but that still doesn't stop you from doing all these things no way unfortunately most people don't take action because of that fear yeah so what is the advice you would give to somebody you know like i said your background is so incredible you've done all these varied things but you've ended up in the most advanced field of medicine <laughs> working with the top doctors in the world what advice would you have to somebody like you well i think that the one thing that i would say and every time i do feel f- fear is that i really go down into so what would happen what is the worst that could happen and every time i don't find a good enough reason i just get up and move on so i literally there are so many times that i feel fear and i say okay fine what what's going to happen if you know if i fail at this you know what's going to happen if um it doesn't pan out the way i would like it to you know and usually the answer is that okay then you'll shut shop and you go back home and then you'll probably start again so so it's amazing what you talked about so tim ferris mm-hmm. uh who talks about this he's one of the uh, you know award winning uh, best selling authors new york times yes big follower yeah, he okay. talks about fear setting mm mm-hmm. and i recently met him uh, in vancouver and his talk was around uh, once again how people do not plan for fears mm. and if they if the worst case scenario is thought about mm-hmm. f- before mm-hmm. how things can change and it's amazing how you exactly describe that 
you know one thing that i noticed was that even the fear of cancer um stems from a complete na- lack of knowledge about what cancer even is there is so many misconstrued um assumptions and presumptions the funny thing is if you google anything it will finally say that this yeah. is going to take cancer if you say you have a stomach ache a toothache a yeah. headache yeah. and you know if you google it and after five searches you're like oh god do i have cancer exactly and everyone perceives it as such a scary illness and so did we and i remember my family uh, we were you know somewhere and they i remember them looking at me and saying that you know we have this fear that what if we get it and i said just go go down into what even cancer is understand it from a cellular level understand how cancer actually happens in the system and then you will know that it's in your control when you know how it happens and how it develops and progresses in your body you know how you can deal with it and when i f- feel fear i go and learn about what exactly is that so i used to suffer a lot with panic attacks and anxiety attacks when you know my mom was going through cancer and all of that and um i actually went deep down to what are panic attacks why does this happen and it it just cleared up to so studying about your most your fears can itself make you unfearful of that 100% and it's also the the um the notion of what that fear or what that thing is going to bring to you but when you actually face it it's not that scary that's what i've seen i mean it's it's almost like superstitions right i mean we yeah. just believe in doing something because somebody else told us without even understanding the logic or if they, it doesn't even have any logic at some point exactly right? exactly and so if you just face it up front and say okay fine i have this fear what's the worst can, that can happen and what is this fear where is it stemming from what will it really do for me or to me and when you really go and like actually study and break it down you realize that oh okay fine this is really not that scary so so for people who are suffering from cancer or who have friends or family from suffering from cancer uh what advice do you have for them what can they do differently and if they are undergoing chemotherapy today or they know of somebody what advice can you give them what do they go and tell their doctor or hospital that what do they need because i don't think so most people are even aware of this i think uh, number 1 is don't panic because it really is not as scary as it's made out to be number 2 is it all lies in your immune system um do whatever it takes to boost immunity and three is don't be afraid to question the doctors my biggest regret in my entire life was not to question was to just follow suit so i would just say do these three things and whatever looks as the best option that would look after you physically and mentally but i think one of the problems is that most doctors are not willing to answer these questions right they are just yeah. too busy so what do you do if, you know your doctors and because now every every person is googling and going back to the doctors so doctors are also getting really tired of some really stupid questions yeah that is true that is happening in fact we tell all our patients just don't go on google it's like ban <laughs> just no google um so we we are trying to get out there we are trying to you know um educate we want to use our writing platforms our blog posts even maybe video content to start talking about this you know and uh, spreading the knowledge and and the carer program how expensive is it is it affordable for a normal person who's just you know making already a cancer treatment is so expensive i have uh, done everything in my power to make it as nominal as possible because i know what treatment costs i didn't want someone to turn away from the program because it was too expensive so we broke it down to about 8000 rupees a month and you get all your specialists who visit you in your house for 6 months wow so we we kept it as nominal as possible in fact i have been given a lot of flack for this and said that you need to you're undervaluing yourself and all of that currently it is this amount and um and yeah and we want to make it such that you know everyone has access to it and and we were talking that insurance is currently not covering this too yeah, yeah and and what could insurance companies do i mean why would insurance companies want to cover this for patients because it obviously uh, can decrease your risk of relapse it's getting a person healthier permanently it's not a quick fix it's not a pill that you take and then you know 
you're done for that and then it's back again it's about educating and teaching a patient so whatever we provide to them yes we give them the therapies at home but we also have you know coaches who educate them as to why this is important and help them continue for the rest of their life but i'm sure that as part of your program there would still be people who wouldn't make it you know cancer would still still consume them unfortunately what happens is there are a lot of patients who come to us at last stages when the doctors have said there's no hope and they say okay you'd give us whatever you know we can do and i we make it very clear to them that you have reached a point where it's terminal but we never say it's over or you know there's no hope we just never say that that is just something that just doesn't even resonate with us but yes we um we do have patients who come to us at last stages and who really have not much left so we we concentrate on quality of life how difficult is it to deal with such terminal patients i mean you've done it once with your mother right i mean now you are literally dealing with literally hundreds of these people how is it i mean how is it different that time and now that you have so many people under your care who are going through this you know we have so we've lost two patients um and that was purely because they came to us very at very late stages it's tough i'm not going to lie and say it's easy but you build and you build some type of immunity to it the more you go through it the the no my my uh, my my point was that are you reliving your the, the time you had with your mother and like trying to do things differently is that what you were really doing in a way yes so it was very strange because at the start uh, i would get clients uh, or patients and family members that were replicas of us as a family so i would literally see myself in so many um daughters whose mothers were diagnosed with cancer but it was very different because they would question they would say how how but how are you going to help our mother you know how is this going to benefit her how is she going to heal and things like that so yes i there were many times that i relived it and i still do and i cannot say that you know i have mastered the art of uh, you know having a detachment it does affect me sometimes but i think it's it's all time and i think it's uh, you know experience and i think a lot of self care is what i have to indulge in so so where do you think you will be 10 years from now with carer and everything else you're doing in a your a global life? organization we want to go global we want to have a uh, home health care that provides holistic therapies for chronic ailments around the world at your doorstep i would like to expand beyond cancer i would like to go into the space of diabetes of cardiac of neuro things but like isn't that. cancer itself so big yes no? yes it is so um yeah cancer is our space right now and we want to really thrive in that we want to provide therapies and i think the next thing that we will do is go into the space of pediatrics where we provide holistic therapies for children that are going through cancer and give them you know these therapies at home um but then expand beyond that as well mm-hmm. so how has uh, you know your family helped you i mean you come from a family which is you know doing all this business and you're also in a way i think related to the mahindra group and all mm-hmm. of that mm-hmm. so did that help in any ways on whatever you did so my family in terms of uh, my immediate family they were you know and they have been very supportive of course in terms of uh, my father's side which is the mahindra family anand mahindra was very very supportive so i it's not that we had a very strong relationship all my life but when i moved back to india i went and met him and uh, you know just reconnected and all of that and he definitely did help uh, you know open few doors and was very very supportive of what i what i'm doing and he's definitely a mentor to kind of understand how to run businesses so what i what, I, what my idea was that it was not like you know because you had all this money and funding you oh my god no <laughs> no i i wish no 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 not at all it was all in fact um it was all done on my accord whatever um i had and i saved is what i put into this company and i still do lot of people ask me is it uh funded by the mahindras is it funded by any other external investor and i say it not at all it's personal so so are you having any plans to raise money maybe in the future 
maybe in the future i want it to be a self sustainable business um and even though those who come on board i really want them to speak the language that we do well that's really rare giving the dot com as you saw most of these companies are raising millions and billions and writing it off and nobody has a business model and especially in the health space we have seen so many startups uh come on i think you have a very different model than everybody else so actually believe it or not and it's i'm not complaining but I'll, there have been vcs who have come to me by linkedin and things like that and said we want to talk to you and we would like to invest or whatever um i have uh, stepped away because i don't want it to become a numbers game right now for me it's about the quality of healthcare that i'm providing to patients when we can handle a numbers game is when we will go in that space and I, and i think it's you know i tell a lot of people right it's not money which can solve the problem what you need is a product a real problem are you solving a real problem exactly and exactly. i think in your case with your own experience you identified a problem learned about it went methodically methodically about it mm. and then came up with this idea so this is not a uh, somebody reading a report in a newspaper and saying i am going to start hyper local delivery of something because or not at there all. are so many of these home health services who yeah. are sending you physiotherapists and yeah. this and that yeah. and we know the quality over there is very very challenging i think I think you have to also know what is the purpose of your business. So yes, there are, you know there are people who start businesses and they want to exit and all of that and that's great. For me I'm building a foundation. For me I'm building something that's going to last hopefully beyond me and you know way beyond that. So it's not about uh you know funding it in growth rates and numbers and things like that right now. It's about quality healthcare and it's and I don't want to lose the soul of my business, you know, because we're still so real in the game. and we're still so connected to each one of our patients so it's a that itself is a very beautiful feeling well all i can tell you is that whenever you're raising money please ping me definitely uh, we'll uh, you know definitely <laughs> figure out a way to to help you on this because Thank what you. you are doing is really really needed more than anything else so let me quickly talk to you about your own self mm mm-hmm. with all this stress and all these patients and all these doctors how do you manage your life what is your daily routine um i think so i'm a very i i can see i've become a very disciplined person that works for me having a routine works for me i do give about an hour to myself every morning and that just goes without saying so meditation has become a big part of my life exercise always was and do you do guided meditation or do you any no. kind of meditation i do a meditation that we do in our program it's called the heartfulness meditation and it has changed my life and um that's something that i really dedicate to heartfulness myself. is the one from the lady in coimbatore uh, no that's a different no one. no 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 this is a global organization okay. yeah so um that's what i do and i think i don't know i i there is nothing else that i can say that you know is just a complete extreme from my work and and what's your typical breakfast it it's always very healthy it's always more protein to be honest um i'm not the south indian breakfast person which mm-hmm. i find a lot of people in mumbai are um but yeah it's probably eggs and maybe some toast and you know uh, beans and things like that i'm a big tim ferris fan when it comes to breakfast and so so you that. are following the 4 oh, hour body yeah huh? <laughs> i've read all his books yeah so no, tim ferris is uh, is really one of my inspirations my yeah. guru my mentor yeah. in fact uh, uh, partly the whole idea of uh, of this show came from what tim ferris mm-hmm. is itself doing mm-hmm. i think uh, and uh, i think it's amazing it's 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 refreshing to meet another tim ferris fan yes so what is what is your favorite tim ferris book and or tim ferris idea the 4 hour work week 100% that something really resonated and actually changed the way i i work so there was one um, you know rule that he had in there which is the pareto's rule where yeah. it's 80 20 and um, i literally did that i changed the way i was working and i started putting effort and time into um 20% of everything that would give me 80% of the results it really changed the way i started working that's a big book i just read tools of the titans yeah. and um, that was an eye opener as well that's and and nice. which which particular titan inspired you i don't know if there was one in particular but one 
routine inspired me and that was actually um writing so i still do it where in the morning you basically write what you aspire to be but you you almost you know write it out in terms of um i think there was one way there was oh, i don't remember but he said um that this is what i want to achieve and you keep writing it 15 times i don't know it just became a part of my routine now and i do it every morning actually d- d- writing in a diary is something that i do every morning so who are the other authors you you read i read a lot of autobiographies um but one book that has always been something that has stayed in my heart is living with the himalayan masters and what's that book about i have, i have not read that so it's the life of yogis and things like that and how they master their lives in in which is so unconventional to the way we live our mundane lives and it's very inspiring yeah that's something that stayed within me yeah what is your a possession or something you bought which is let's say worth 10 less than 10000 rupees which you use a lot i absolutely hate shopping and i'm not a shopper um so if i really need to buy anything that it it, ha- it has to be something that i really need um i think the last thing that i bought was the geo dongle which was under 10000 rupees well all i can say is geo has indeed changed the way india geos india's yes. life yes uh i got a geo sim uh, and it gives me 1 gb a day yes. for 30 days by the way this is not a paid endorsement <laughs> of reliance in any ways but mukesh bhai wherever you are you are changing the way india uses the internet absolutely absolutely yeah. i think that's that's apart from the geo dongle anything else which comes to your mind i no i don't i don't shop i just don't buy things unless i really really require it so that's probably the last thing that i can think of for a very long time well uh, you don't shop you don't indulge So how do you spend your weekends? I do now? indulge. I do indulge. You indulge I in love what? traveling. Okay. Uh travel is a very big part of my life. I am not able to do as much of it right now because of all the work, but when I do travel, I really indulge. And and where was your last travel? The last travel was to LA and New York in October for my 30th. Oh, okay. So yes. that was more again a a long holiday or It was 3 weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah, the 3 so weeks was good. Yeah. and do you have friends there or just on your own and new york's like my home now so yes i have a lot of friends uh la i had a few friends so i went and met them as well but yeah it's very com- it's a very comfortable place for me i think uh, f- finally before i end what i really wanted to ask you is that what are the three lessons you have learned in your last 10 years you know going from a carefree student to possibly somebody who is now handling people's lives you know these are two extremes right i mean there was there was a time you were carefree and you know around the world the only person you were responsible was yourself yeah and today uh at being so young and you are like responsible for people's lives of chronically ill patients without being a doctor without being yes. in the medical field without having a background in medicine number 1 uh because this was my biggest regret and i learned a lot from it today is always question always question whatever is put in front of you question it two is um you can achieve anything it's in your hands there is nothing that you can't achieve you know we there are only excuses but there's really nothing that you know you you can't go out there and accomplish and three is which i'm living by right now is don't look back keep moving just keep moving and and do you also use the pareto principle 100% yeah all the time it's changed the way i work and so that's something that has actually changed my company so, so where are are there like two examples on how you use it in your day to day life in my work um uh, work or day to day life so in my you... work the way i have used it is that um before i was you know spending a lot of time trying to collaborate with hospitals things like that where i just now bypass all of it and go to the patient um and i spend most of my time meeting patients and and talking to them about it because at the end of the day they are the consumers of what we're doing that has changed the game for us um in my daily life uh, i think the way i plan my day 
because I think when you're running or starting a company, there's no concept of time. But I, I, I'm very good at uh, planning my day in such a way that, you know, whatever is being dealt with or accomplished at that specific time is productive for that day. And do you travel light or do you have a big ba- big bag or suitcase? I travel very light. I don't have, like I, the least I can carry the better. I'm actually, it's disgraceful, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's not disgraceful. It is smart, I would say, especially. Yeah, in... I just can't, uh, I just, uh, you know, that added uh, weight is something that just troubles me. So you are so accomplished and I know the carer program is going to go places. Uh while all this is going on, do you have certain non-professional goals, like in your personal life, anything else you want to achieve? Non-professional. So I think, uh, yeah, in my personal life, definitely I would um, some point get married. But then again, I don't know how relevant the institution of marriage is today. But I think find a companion. It's mm-hmm. always nice to have someone who's, you know, there with you so I think that's something also experiencing motherhood so uh, it's, it just seems like everyone in my family and everyone around me are having children so maybe <laughs> that's why I'm feeling like this but yeah motherhood is um you know to to be able to raise a child in a certain way and you know be very conscious um and mindful of uh, the way they are brought up and make them something or at least help them reach somewhere it would be very interesting I'm sure Samara your mother is really proud of you yeah, wherever so. she is looking at all the stuff you have done i think uh, uh, her life you have now celebrated it in such a beautiful way with the carer program if you had a chance to meet her again once what is the one thing you will tell her or ask her i would just say you're a rock star and thank you that's it thanks a lot samara it has been an absolute pleasure it has been a pleasure thank you thank you Thank you.